So, the book of Galatians, chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 25 there at the end where it says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I kind of wanted to just start out by looking at that one verse there. And I thought as I was reading uh, this chapter the other day, what an interesting phrase that is, that he says there, You know, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And what he says there, when he let us, if, if we live in the Spirit, we know, of course, he's saying, if, you know, if we have life through the Spirit, if we're saved, you know, we live in the Spirit. You know, God has renewed our spirit with His Spirit, and we're, all things are become new. You know, we're a new creature in Christ and the inner man, and uh, we live in the Spirit. But then he goes on and says in that same breath, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, so kind of a way to think about this phrase to kind of, if we were to put it another way, it would be like, if we're saved, we might as well live like it. You know, if we're saved today, if we've been bought, uh, bought by the blood of Christ, if we've been born again, we might as well live like it. You know, we might as well do the things that God has asked us to do. We might as well glorify Him in our body and in our, in our thoughts and, and, and live like we are saved people. Now we know that we don't have to do those things. We don't have to walk in the Spirit in order to live in the Spirit. We're going to live in the Spirit. We're sailed under the day of our, of our redemption. You know, God has, has paid the, put down the, the down payment, the redemption. Uh, of our of our uh, the price of our redemption has been has been paid for, but uh, you know that being the case, we might as well live like it. You know, and a lot of people we could liken it onto the fact that we've kind of been set on a new path. You know, if we've been saved, maybe we're you know before time we were going astray, we were wandering off in, a, in, a, in another way. But God, when He saves us, He kind of sets us on that new path that He w desires us to walk in. You know, He wants us to walk in the Spirit to follow after Him. And uh, the Bible says in Psalm, you're there, go and turn to Philippians chapter 3, but it says in Psalm 119, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You see, there's a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. There's a path that God wants us to walk down. He wants us to walk in the Spirit. The Bible talks a lot about walking and following and, 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 and moving forward for Christ and pressing toward the mark and these type of, of uh, phrases that are used. And we've kind of been set on a new path when it comes to salvation. So he says there, because we've been on that new path, not only God has set us on a new path, but he's also given us a light and a lamp to guide us on that path. <clears throat> and, you know, if we've been given a lamp, if we've been given a light, we might as well use it. We might as well make sure we're not going to stumble and fall. We might as well shine the light that shines, as the Bible says, as a light in a dark place. I mean, the world is a dark place today, is it not? I mean, it's dark spiritually. It's dark all around us. There's a lot of sin. The Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. That the, the prince, the God of this present world, the prince of the power of the air, you know, he rules and reigns in this world. And he, he is working. And uh, so we know that we, we're, we're walking in a dark world. We need a light. We need somebody to lead us and to guide us. It doesn't make any sense that we would be put on this new path and we'll try to walk down this path and know and, and see where we're going without a lamp. When we have, when it's been given to us, when we've been given this light unto our path. <clears throat> It'd be kind of like if we were to walk into a room and we, we couldn't see. We were kind of standing in the middle of the room and we couldn't see. It was a dark room. It was pitch black. And then somebody turned the light on for us. And we said, oh, now I can see where I'm going. I can see where I'm walking. But then right after that, we just immediately decided to take out a blindfold and put it on. And that wouldn't make any sense, would it? But kind of, that's kind of what Christians do when we've been set on a new path. Sometimes we ignore the fact that the light's been turned on. Or if it has, we'll just put on a blindfold and say, well, you know, I don't really need to see where I'm going. They put the Bible aside. They, they quit coming to church. They quit listening to the things of God. And they start to stumble. And they wonder why. Well, it's because you're not using the light that God has given you. You're not walking in the Spirit. You see, Jesus promised to us that he would be with us always. Did he not? Did he say, I will be with you, lo, even unto the end of the world? So we might as well follow him to the end of our lives. You know, the world's going to end for all of us one, one, one way or another. You know, either Christ is going to come, you know, the Antichrist is going to rise, and we're going to go through the tribulation, we're going to be eventually taken out of here, or maybe we'll die. But one way or another, we're all going to die one day. The world will end. And Jesus has promised that he'd be with us unto the end of that world. However, we and here in this world. So we might as well follow Him. We might as well walk in the Spirit. We might as well walk down this path. Now here's the thing. If you want to follow somebody, obviously you have to walk. You have to put one foot in front of another. I mean, that only makes sense, right? 
if you were, you know, in the military, they put you in a, they were going to put you through boot camp and teach you how to march. You're going to have to actually learn how to move your feet, how to put one foot in front of the other and follow the leader. All right. And the Bible is very clear that that's what we have to do as Christians in our Christian life, that we have to move forward, that we have to learn to walk, that we have to follow after Christ. There in Philippians 3, but the Bible says in Romans 6, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that as like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, we've been buried with Christ in the baptism unto death, We've been renewed. We have the newness of life that God has given us. And he says there that we should also walk in it. I mean, it only makes sense that we should walk and follow after Christ. Look at there Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count on myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. That's walking. That's moving forward. That's pushing. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, let us therefore... As many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in any, anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, we, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us. For an example, the Bible talks an awful lot about walking, about pressing, about following, about moving forward. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Bible says in 1 John 2, He that saith he abideth in him ought to himself also to walk, even as he walked. You know, God's expecting us to grow. God's expecting us to start going down the path he set us on. He's expecting us to follow him. It says there we ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how he ought to walk and to please God. And so you, so you would abound more and more. You know, we ought to walk. Why? To please God. God desires that we walk. God desires that we follow. God desires that we grow and push forward. That is the Christian life. The Christian life is that of growth. It's not this stat. You never stagnate. God doesn't want people to plateau in the Christian life. We should always be trying to do better than the day before. And I know there's going to be peaks and valleys. That's just the reality of it. But overall, I mean, the general arc of our lives should be one where we're growing, where we're pressing forward, where we're moving ahead. It should be a life of momentum. It should be just something, maybe it's not as fast moving as at other times, but God forbid that we would ever stop and even move backwards. That's not God's will. God wants us to move forward in the Christian life to grow. It says there in Ephesians chapter 4, if you would turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. And he gave some apostles, I'll begin in verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, it says there in verse 12. Now, the perfecting means, you know, to make those saints whole, to make you complete as a Christian. That's why we have all of these teachers and pastors and evangelists. That's why God has given us the local church for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a complete man, a whole man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him and in, in, into all into him in all things, which is even which is the head, even Christ. So God desires that we be perfect. God desires that we be no more children. God desires that we grow up into Him in all things. And that's why He's given us the body of Christ. That's why He's given us the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, for the work of the ministry. Now, it would be a real shame after reading all this Scripture and seeing what it is that God desires for us if it never happened in our lives, if we never did grow if we stopped growing, if we stopped moving forward, if we started to backslide or fall out, that would be a real shame, wouldn't it? I mean, we would say that that person really wasted their opportunity. I mean, if they were in a good church, they got saved, they were in a good church, and they just decided, you know what, they forsook it, they said it's not important enough to me. You know, whether they realize it or not on this earth, they've actually wasted their opportunity to grow in Christ and to serve God. And that's the title of the sermon this evening is Don't Waste 
your opportunity. Don't waste your opportunity. Go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 3. You see, we've been given a great opportunity to serve God in our lives. The fact that we, as we spoke this morning, that we even have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, that we have a means by which we can communicate to the very God of heaven through His Word and our spirit bearing witness with His Spirit. You know, we've been given a great opportunity to serve God with our lives. We should not waste our opportunity. Don't waste your opportunity. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then she also, shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now all ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds." and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So Paul kind of gets after him a little bit there in that passage, doesn't he? He says, you know what? Because of the fact that we've been you know, born again, essentially is what he's saying, because you're dead and your life is hidden in Christ, you need to mortify. You need to kill the body. You need to put off all these affections. That's what he said there, right? He said, mortify the members. You know, and sometimes that's, that's what a lot of pastors, that's what we should be preaching. That's what a lot of at least preachers should be preaching. You know, obviously I'm not a pastor, but those that would stand up behind a pulpit and preach God's Word, they should be preaching these type of things that Paul preached. They should preach that we need to mortify the members. You know, and a person is going to come to a church where somebody's preaching the Word of God and saying, hey, you need to mortify your members. That's going to be a consistent message. At least it should be. It should be something that we hear on a consistent basis coming across the pulpit. I mean, go read the New Testament and see how many times Paul... You know, gets after people about fornication. It's 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 a it's a frequent subject that comes up in scripture. Yeah. But people will get in a church where it's preached, and they'll say, "Well, why does the preacher have to you know get on fornication so much?" I mean, I remember one time, pastor talking to Pastor Anderson, him saying, "You know, I preach on fornication. I try to touch on fornication almost every single sermon, at least mention it." You know, there was a time, and I, and I started paying attention. I was like, "You know what? He's right." It seems like almost every sermon he somehow fit, fits that in there. Why? Because the, the unsaved and lost world or the newly saved, the babes in Christ that come into the body of Christ, they come in with baggage. They come in as fornicators. And they have to be told, you need to knock that off. You need to stop being a fornicator. That's why the preacher has to get up and hit on a sin like fornication so much. He says there, Paul says, to put off the old man with his deeds. Now why does the preacher have to get up and talk about sin so much? Why is it that Paul's always talking about putting off the old man with his deeds and putting on the new man. Because we still have this flesh. You know, we still have this flesh to deal with in this life. He goes on there and says, you know, put on the new man. You know, why does the preacher have to keep talking about prayer and church attendance and Bible reading and soul winning? Why and you know why does he keep harping on these things? Why do we keep having to be reminded of these things? Why does he say there, seek ye those things which are above? Set your affection on the things above and not on the earth. You know, why does the preacher always have to rip on, you know, not being covetousness, not desiring things that aren't yours, or, you know, the love of money? Or why does he have to preach on all these things all the time? Well, the same reason Paul did. The same reason Paul got after all these things. The preacher understands what Paul understands or understood. And what is it that Paul understood? What is it that the preacher understands? Well, what they understand is what Jesus taught. I mean, he knew what Jesus, his take on all this was. And that's why he preached the way he preached. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus taught a great truth there. When he said, you know, the things that you value in this life, the things that are important to you, that's where your heart's going to be. You know, if your heart isn't pleasing God and walking after Him and His commandments and growing in Christ and in His knowledge, it's not going to happen. You know, you're not just going to walk, stumble into church and somehow just... You know, it's not just going to rub off on you and you're going to walk away just some, by you know, osmosis or something like that. You're going to have to actually purpose in your life to do all these things, to mortify the members, to put off the old man, to put on the new man, to seek those things which are above. That's something you're going to have to determine to do in your life. 
And if you don't, your treasure will be somewhere. Mark my words, your treasure will be somewhere in this life. You know, you're going to value something. You're gonna, there's going to be something that you desire, want to go after. There's going to be something that you want for yourself in this life. And that is where your heart will be also. You see, Paul preached like this, and, and, and any preacher worth his salt preaches like this because they understand that the people that they preach to one day will give an account for what they did in this life. One day they're going to give an account for what they did. It says there in verse 5 of Colossians 3, Mortify therefore. So there's a therefore, right? And the old rule we've always heard, what's the therefore therefore? Why is it that he has to preach all these things? Well, it's right there in verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's why Paul preached the way he did. Because Paul, or Paul knew that one day the people he was preaching to were going to appear with Christ in glory. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every single one of us is going to give an account for what we did in this life to God. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's why Paul preached that way. That's why a preacher gets up and gets after these things and asks people to walk after Christ and to clean up their life. Because he understands that one day when Christ comes, those people he's preaching to are going to appear with Christ in glory. And that they, just like he, are all going to give an account for God. It says, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, For ye are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For no other, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You know, he's saying here, look, there's going to be a time when your works, that you, the things that you did in this life are going to be proven. They're going to be tested. They're going to be tried. They're going to, we're going to find out what sort they were. And we're all going to have wood, hay, and stubble. But some people, that's all they're going to have. But the point we're trying to make here right now is that one day you're going to appear before Christ in glory, and you're going to give an account. Your works will be tried. So the question is, What's it going to be like for you when you appear before Christ in glory? You know, we think about that moment and it thrills us, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory, the, the fact that one day that we're going to have a new body, right? And says that, you know, we, we don't yet, we, we know not what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we shall be as He is. And what a thrill that is to think that we're going to have a glorified body in Christ like His that will be perfect that all of eternity will be laid out before us. That we'll be going into the millennium with Christ to rule with and reign with Him over the nations and see just the most magnificent kingdom that ever existed set up here on earth. I mean, we often think about those things and they're, and they're thrilling to think about, but I wonder how many of us think about how quickly you would consider your life in the light of that moment, what you accomplished here. How quickly will it turn from all the things that you are going to do to all the things you did do? How quickly will think, man, everybody else is getting these rewards handed out. You know, there's the crowns being given out. Everyone's receiving rewards. People are given ten cities to rule over, five cities to rule over. You know, the lion's coming down to me. Eventually, I'm going to stand. I'm going to give an account. I'm going to receive my reward. And they start to wonder. They start to ponder. They start to think about what it is they actually did in their life. <clears throat> Bible says in 1 John, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at, at His coming. He says, the reason why you need to abide in Him, the reason why you need to do these things to mortify the members, to put on the new man, is that when you appear with Him in glory, when you appear, you may have confidence 
and not be ashamed. There's going to be some people that day saved. That's not going to change. But they're, going to, they're God's children, but they're going to stand there and it's going to start to slowly dawn on them that they wasted their opportunity. And you know what? They're going to stand up and they're going to give an account and they're going to have to hang their head. And that realization is going to hit them like a ton of bricks. <clears throat> I wonder how long it will take a person like that to figure out that the preacher was right. In that moment, how long will it go through their mind? You know what? The preacher was right. I should have mortified my members. I should have gotten out of fornication. I should have put off the old man. I should have walked after Christ. I should have done those things. So the question is, you know, how much of your work will abide? We're all going to have works that burned up. The wood, hay, and stubble there, I believe that's just the things, the kind of things we have to do in this life just to survive. The kinds of things that, you know, wood, hay, and stubble, those are all useful things. They're not necessarily the most valuable things. But they all, have, they all could serve a purpose. But they will burn up. The question is, will you have anything left over that you did for Christ in your life, outside of your job, outside of just doing the things that you had to do in this life to survive? Will there be anything left over? You know, I heard a preacher say this once a while back, and it's always kind of stuck with me. The fact that, it, it, you know, if it's, if it's this literal where there's going to be a fire that burns up our works, I can't explain how that could be. But let's say, okay, and whatever's left over in that fire is yours. If you can go through and you can find the gold and you can find the silver and you can find the precious stones that remain of your works that are burned up, those are yours. Those are your rewards, right? But I wonder how many people are going to get down and start to look through that ash and realize that's all they have. It's just ash. Can you imagine walking around heaven and everybody else has just got crowns and gold and silver and precious stones and all you've got is ash? Maybe you've got a whole wheelbarrow full of ash. I don't know. How careful you'd be, I mean, how careful you'd be with that ash to not let it blow away. It's all you got for all of eternity. That's a sad thought. I wonder, is that what we're going to have when we stand there before God? How many people are just going to realize all they have to offer? The God that saved them, the God that glorified them, the God that, that has set them in His kingdom, all they'll have to offer is smash. That's a sobering thought. At least it ought to be. <clears throat> So the fact is, you know, there are going to be people that don't have anything but ash. They, there will be rewards that go unclaimed. There will be work that goes undone on this earth. That's a fact. The question is, why? Why is it that there is going to be people in such a sad state, having nothing but ash? Well, we know one reason. It can't be because there's a lack of riches on God's behalf. I mean, the streets are paved with cold up there, right? He says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. It's not because God is going to run out of, jewel, of precious stones to give out. It's not because God is going to run out of rewards. He owns a thousand of the cattle, the cattle on a thousand hills, right? And the gold in every mine is His. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's able to you know, abundantly reward us for our labors. It's not like you're going to get to God for your rewards. He's going to stand there with his pockets out and say, Sorry, I ran out. Whoops, my bad, I didn't. I didn't set enough aside. That's not the problem. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We know that if we do labor, that we will receive a reward if we labor in, in, in for the Lord. And it's certainly not because there's a lack of available work to do, is it? I mean, Jesus said, going into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. Has that happened? Has every creature that we know in this world received the gospel or an opportunity to hear a clear presentation? Not by, not by even a, a stretch of the imagination. So people are going to go without a reward, not because God has run out of rewards to hand out, or not because there isn't enough work for them to earn rewards. You know, God has no spiritual unemployment line. Every single one of His children here has work to do. God's economy is thriving. You know, Amen. It's booming. There's help wanted ads everywhere. You can get employed in the Lord's army. The reason why people are going to have no reward, the reason why people are going to waste the opportunity that's been given them, is because people simply place more emphasis on earthly matters than heavenly rewards. They get caught up and the, they get entangled in the affairs of this life. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. 
a con, uh, you know, a very familiar parable that I'm sure that we're all all familiar with here. Uh, you know, the parable of the sower, the one that went out and sowed the seed and it fell on the different types of ground. And then here in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 18, Jesus begins to explain the meaning of the parable. He says in verse 18, "Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one." And catcheth the way that which was sown in his heart, this is he which received the seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receive it, yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. But look at verse 22. He talks about this, this other type of ground. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that seareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now it's interesting that this ground that this, sowed a seed in, this seed is sowed in here, there's nothing wrong with the ground. It's perfectly capable of supporting life. I mean, after all, it's got thorns in it. There's plenty of other plant life growing up in it. It's good ground. It could accomplish much. It has the ability to do something to support life but when God's seed is sown there, that plant, that fruit that he wants to bear in that ground, in that person's life, isn't able to come forth. Because that person has never bothered to go in there and clear out the thorns. You know, sometimes we need to weed our hearts out of these thorns that would choke God's word. What are those weeds? The deceitfulness of riches. I mean, isn't that what just the world lifts up today? Is that just the dream? To hit the lotto? to make a bunch of money, to be famous, to just have your bank accounts full. That's what they lift up today. Yeah. The Bible says it's deceitful. Some of those people are the most miserable people you'll ever meet. Yep. They can never get enough. They're never satisfied. They're never content. They don't learn to value what really matters in life. They're deceived by the riches. They're, and those things choke the word. People start to chase after that. I don't have time for church. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for these things of God. I don't have time for the soul winning. I don't have time for any of this because I've got to get those riches. I've got to get whatever it is that I've set my affections on. My heart is after those things. And they end up getting choked out. <clears throat> we saw that God equips us for the work. Doesn't He? God gives us, he gives us the hoe and He gives us the gloves and He gives us the little... That little rake that you know every mom's mom had that had a garden. He says you can go out and clean out that garden, and you can get the weeds out. We saw that in Ephesians. You know God gives us the ministers. God gives us the opportunity to get our hearts cleaned up and our lives right to put off the old man. The opportunity to be part of a good church. That's an opportunity a lot of people waste. Go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter ten. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I feel like I've been reading this verse a lot. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But that is something that people need to take heed to. Yeah. Because when you forsake the local body, when you forsake the church, you're wasting an opportunity. Yeah. You're wasting an opportunity to not only just hear the preaching of the Word of God that's going to help you in your walk, that's going to help you and encourage you and motivate you and convict, and convict you and cause you to want to get right with God, but you're also going to waste a lot of fellowship, of building relationships with people that are going to help you, help you to grow. You know, it'd be a real shame if, if this church here, and if Faithful Word Tucson never reached its full potential. And I think this church has a lot of potential. I think we've got a great group of people that are coming. We've got a great core of people that are committed and want to go out and do the work. But what if some of us got an attitude and decided it wasn't that important anymore? That there were other things that we needed to set our affections on. And what if, it, what if it got to the point where this church just had to close up its doors one day? I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm Quite honestly, I'm not really that worried about it. And this is probably more of just a, one of those points that are more preventative you know, than anything, just to make sure it doesn't happen. But wouldn't that be a shame if we didn't reach the potential that we could? 
to reach Tucson because people didn't care enough to come to church because they were too busy doing whatever. And I, I don't know what it is that people do that they get too busy to do to come to church because I've been in church you know, three times a week for nigh on 20 years. So I, I, I know today's the Super Bowl. Maybe that's it. I, I, you know what I mean? I don't know what it is that people get so busy with or become so much more important than being here in the house of God to yeah. hearing the preaching of the Word of God. And I know people get sick and they go through times where it's difficult or you know, it's best that they stay home for their own well-being and things like that, but man, I hope it's never because people just stop caring. Yeah. Because they just it's not important to them that this church reaches its potential. You know, it wouldn't be a shame if we wasted the opportunity to raise our kids for God. To be in a church where the, the Bible's being preached on how to do that. When we can have, we have godly, not just my kids, other examples that we could look to and see, like, hey, this is how it's being done. That there would be other people in the church that we could go and talk to and say, hey, tell me what you're doing. How is it that I can get my kids like that? And I, and I think we got a, a, a great group of kids that, that come here that are, that are very well behaved and respectful. And that doesn't just happen by accident. Wouldn't it be a, 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 a shame if you know, people forsook the Word of God or forsook the, the Church of God and gave up the opportunity to find a godly spouse? You know, we worry about it. We think about who our kids are going to marry one day. Well, I'll tell you what, you, you want them to marry well. Be, having them in church is a good place to start. I mean, would you rather have them go find them on a bar stool somewhere? That usually doesn't go very well. I mean, there's, every, there's rules or exceptions to every rule. You know, God's grace is, is good, but I don't, want, I don't want my kids out there, you know, taking a chance on that. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's not what I want. I want them to find a good spouse. It would be a shame if I ruined their lives by pulling them out of church. <clears throat> wasted their opportunity. Wouldn't it be a shame if we wasted the opportunity to go out and just win souls to Christ? To go out and learn from other seasoned soul winners that we have around us. You know, I, I got to go out to Indio yesterday and uh, I went soul winning all day with Pastor Anderson. You know, I felt very privileged yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. I haven't been soul winning in, 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 in some time. And the first time I ever went soul winning, we kind of talked about it. We kinda, I kind of reminded him about it. It's kind of a funny story. Maybe we can talk about it later. But um, the first time, and it's been, I've only gone soul winning a handful of times. I mean, why? Because there's so many other people at Faithful Word that I can go soul winning with so many other times and so many other people I can learn from. But yesterday when I went, I said, man, what an opportunity to learn from somebody. And I've been soul I've done my fair share of soul winning. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm decent at it. I've gotten people saved that I can do a good job. But I thought, man, here's an opportunity to learn from somebody who's probably even better at it than I am. Yeah. And I didn't waste that opportunity by getting all puffed up and think, trying to say, well, I'm going to impress him. I'm going to show the pastor how I do it. Yeah. You know, I, I listened up. My ears perked up when he was giving the gospel. It was usually in Spanish. <laughs> but I did the best I could. You know, I asked him, hey, what did he say? What did you say? And he, he would explain it to me. Or I would talk to somebody and he would give his two cents. And, you know, thankfully, I was glad to say, you know, that we were on the same page most of the time. You know, he didn't have to really point anything out. Now, he has in the past. There's been other times he said, hey, you need to work on this. Or, hey, you need to think about that. And I said, yes, sir, and I tried to do those things. But wouldn't it be a shame if I just said, well, that's not that important. Well, I know better than him. No, my way is better. I know how to do it. It would be a real shame to waste that opportunity. It would be a real shame if we waste the opportunity to be a part of a church that goes out and wins souls. Are you in Romans 10? Look at verse 14. It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? You know, if people waste the opportunity to be sent out from a local church to go out and do soul winning, you know, the vast majority of them are not going to do it. It's just going to go undone. People who say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, they don't have the character to get in church. They probably don't have enough character to go out and, and pick themselves up and go out soul winning. What about, you know, we were kind of talking about that in the preaching class, the opportunity to preach. Well, it would be a shame if an opportunity to preach came up and no one was ready. The sermon never got wrote. You know, if I was coming down this morning in that heavy rain and did a little hydroplaning and ended up in a ditch and said, hey, got to make a phone call. You guys ready? 
Uh, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> That's not a phone call you want. You know, and an opportunity to get up and preach the word of God, to be a blessing to God's people, to share something that's been on your heart, maybe, is gone. Opportunity to preach, not a necessity, an opportunity. <clears throat> you know, and we see a lot of opportunity here in this church, don't we? There's, we see a lot of opportunity to go out soul winning, to learn all these things that we talked about. The, to raise our kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to see them marry well, to, to go out and do the soul winning, to do all these things, to, to have the opportunities to preach and to, and to get our lives right, to be into the preaching of, of God's Word. It's a great opportunity. And it's a great, there's a lot of potential. But you know, when, I, when I'm here, just like any church, and I'm sure others in this room feel the same way, I don't just see opportunity. And I don't just see potential in this church. <clears throat> you know, I, and I definitely don't see a preacher or, 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 or a family of that preacher that doesn't care or isn't interested in this church and isn't motivated and willing to get, get in the yoke and get something done with the people in this church. And you can't, no one can look up here and say that's what they see. But they don't see somebody who's willing to get after it with you guys. And when I look out there, you know, I, I don't, I don't, see, I don't feel that way either. I feel, you know, hey, we got some people here that want to do some some work, that are serious about serving God, that love God, that want to serve Him. <clears throat> you know, and and we've had people come and go, and they and they and they a little bit here and there, and they, I, I just wonder sometimes when they come in if all they see are the cheap plastic seats, or they see the tight quarters that we're in. And that stupid wall that's in the way. <laughs> you know, they see that giant monitor that's, that's broadcasting a guy that's just on the other side of the wall, right? And I get it. It's, no, it's, it's tough. You know, it's not, it's not the ideal situation. You know, they come in and they hear that a cappella singing from this guy. You know what I mean? But is that all we see when we come in here? Just the poor facilities? Just the cheap seats that... And I'm not in them as much as you guys. I'm sure they're not that comfortable. They're squeaky, that's for sure, right? When I look at, at Faithful Word Tucson, I see a lot more than all that. And I'm sure everyone in this room does too. You know what I see is I see souls that came at a price. I see people that God purchased with His own blood. Amen. That's who I see. God's children. And I look at that mat back there, and I don't just see you know some mat that we got to color in. Yeah. Every one of those streets is houses with people on it that are dying and going to hell. And it's our job to go out and reach them. That's what I see. I see people that Christ died for. That's what I see when I look at the church. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. This, this church didn't come cheap. The rent's low, but this church didn't come cheap. It cost our Savior his own life. You know, Jesus died for this church just like any other church of New Testament believers. Amen. And I don't think him asking us to live for him is asking too much. Yeah. And that's my message, that we would follow Christ in this church and not waste the opportunity that we've been given. Let's pray.